All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from a lovely break. Here we have our next speaker, Richard Turkbergen, who is going to tell you every single thing you ever wanted to know about optical networking, but we're deathly afraid to ask. So everybody, please give a warm round of welcome to Richard. <laughs> It's Steenbergen. All right. So the purpose of this tutorial, why are we here talking about optical networking? So the internet is an industry, though the folks in this room uh, largely work with fiber. Everyone who runs a router does everything at this point, unless you're really, really outdated, you're working with fiber. But a lot of router jocks out there just don't get enough exposure to it. They're not actual optical engineers. They don't know how to actually work with this stuff. They kind of learn a little bit by experience and trial. But there's a, a whole bunch of, of more detailed information about optical that you could learn about. So the purpose of this tutorial is really to just kind of touch on a wide variety of topics, uh, clear up misconception, just kind of explain a whole bunch of fundamentals about optical networking. Uh, so will this make you an optical engineer? Nope, definitely not. Uh, if you ever want to, no, oh, sorry, Greg, get out. Uh, if you ever want to want to see some real optical engineers, go to the OFC conference, and that will make your head explode with uh, interesting physics. Uh, but really, yeah, like I said, the purpose is to touch on a little bit of everything from the mundane to the unusual and kind of go through a basic understanding of, of optics. So start with the very basics of fiber optic transmission. Ultimately, fiber is nothing more than a waveguide for light. And all that means is you put light on one side and it comes out the other. Uh, it's mostly done with, with glass, some kind of silica, uh, but it could also be plastic. Um, and you know, the, the question people always ask is, well, why do we use fiber in the first place? What's the advantage? So the big advantage is it's really cheap to produce. Uh, glass is cheap. It's much cheaper than copper. Uh, you can make very large amounts of it. It's very light. Uh, if you think about you know, the, the infrastructure that's required to hold huge amounts of, of data cabling compared to copper, it's massively light, easy to transport, very flexible relative to copper. Uh, it carries a lot of information. We've got systems that are easily doing 20 terabits today, and that's only growing from there. And just when we think we've hit the limits of what we can do, uh, we find a way to do more. Um, you can easily carry many different independent signals, so you can take 50, 80, 100, 200 completely independent things and run them over the same fiber and not have them interfere with each other. So it lets you scale out your network in really interesting ways without having to, to run separate infrastructure all the time. Uh, you can send it for thousands of kilometers without having to regenerate. You still have to amplify. We talked a, a lot more about this, but uh, you can send it for thousands of kilometers and, and uh, not have to, to completely regenerate the signal. And the technology continues to get better and better. So we take infrastructure that was put in the ground in the 80s and still run multi-terabit systems across it today. So a quick lesson in physics. Flashback to high school physics. Light propagates through vacuum, uh, completely empty space, theoretically, uh, at right about 300,000 meters per second. We call that C. Uh, so ballpark 300,000 kilometers per second. There's the exact number. Um, but when light's passing through uh, something that's not a perfect vacuum, it actually propagates much slower than that. So the speed that the light propagates in some material that's not a vacuum is expressed in is what's called a refractive index, and it's expressed as a ratio to C. So as an example, water has a refractive index of 1.33. That means it's 1.33 times slower propagating through water than it is through, through empty space. And when light tries to pass from one medium to another uh, at a different index of refraction, then you can get a reflection to occur. So if you ever swam underwater and look up and you see light being reflected back down to you, that's what's happening there. So all of those things come together to give you something called total internal reflection. The way that this works is the fiber is composed of two different layers. There's a core and a cladding, and the cladding has a higher index of refraction than the core. So that is what forces the light to be constantly bounced back into the core and continue to propagate. Uh, it looks exactly like that. As long as the light comes in at a certain angle called the acceptance cone, it will continue to be total, total internal reflection all the way down to the, to the opposite end and come out the other end of the fiber. So here's a cool demonstration from Wikipedia using a piece of acrylic and a laser pointer. You can see that in action. So 
the inside of a common fiber cable, what are you actually seeing here? Here's a, a single mode fiber cable, and you can see the core itself is 8.5 microns. It's, it's very small. The cladding, which is still a, a piece of the fiber, it's not where the, the signal is carried, but it's still a kind of an inherent part of the, the glass, uh, is, is much thicker. It's around the core. Then you've got an internal buffer that protects the fiber itself, and then you've got the outer jacket, and the, the buffer can move around inside the jacket. There might be some strength members in there and stuff, but uh, this is all done to kind of protect the, the fiber and, and make it so that you don't snap it, bend it, et cetera. But it's basically just a tiny, tiny, hair-thin piece of glass. What do we actually do with the fiber? How do we actually use it? Uh, the vast majority of the systems that are out there are deployed as duplex. That means it's a fiber pair. Uh, so one strand will be used to do the transmit, and the other side will be used to do the receive, and you take that exact thing, you flip it on the other side, so the receive goes to receive and transmit goes to transmit. Um, that results in the simplest and cheapest optics. Uh, so you, this holds true whenever the cost of fiber itself is not prohibitive. But fiber is perfectly capable of carrying many different signals in many different directions over the same strand. It just requires more optical components. So it's really just a, a question of trade-off. If, if you've got a $100 a month fiber, you probably don't care. You'll just run it as a pair. If you've got a multi-million dollar fiber that crosses the country, you probably do care, and you're going to use that to uh, full advantage. And what do we actually send over the fiber? So remember, we're, we're taking digital signals and we're encoding them into analog pulses of light. And historically, the way that that's been done, and still the, the simplest way today, is what's called IMDD, Intensity Modulation with Direct Detection, or some people just call it direct detection. Uh, and the way that that typically works in, in the fiber world is something called NRZ, which is non-return to zero. And all this is is a fancy way of saying bright for a one and dim for a zero. It's, it's literally just a little bit of Morse code with bright and dim flashes uh, done many billions of times per second. So the modulation, the, the symbol change, is called baud. It can happen billions of times a second. Uh, so the receiving end is just a little little photodiode that detects these things, uh, kind of translates it back into ones and zeros, and this works really well. This was the basis of everything up until 10 gig technology, up and in, up into including 10 gig. Once you start to go above, like right now, the magic number for our technology is about 25 gigabaud. Once you start to go past that, it becomes prohibitively difficult. And there's, there's systems out there that do actual 40 gigabaud, uh, but they're much more expensive and it's, it's very difficult to do. And the problem actually gets fundamentally harder. It you know, becomes a, a square problem uh, as that starts to go up. So the reason that you see advances in optical technology that get you beyond 10 gig, for, for a few years we were kind of stuck at 10 gig, and the reason that you see advances in the recent years is we're, we're finally moving on to something that's better than NRZ. Uh, you've got, for example, right now, uh, if you've got a long haul system, if you've got a, a fiber uh, and you're buying a 100 gig wave from someone from Chicago to San Jose, that's going to be a 100 gig QPSK encoded signal. Uh, and you're even starting to see some more exotic things. So, for example, um, 100 gig, uh, there's a, a new thing called PAM4, Pulse Amplitude Modulation. That's a very simplistic way to kind of double the bandwidth, uh, and you're able to. to build uh, QSFP 28 80-kilometer 100-gig optics for cheap now. So you're going to start to see more and more of, of this, and we'll talk more about this later, but that's what we're actually sending over the fiber itself. So we'll start with the most basic distinction of the actual fiber types, multi-mode versus single-mode. Multi-mode is, the whole point of multi-mode is that it's designed specifically to work with cheap light sources. It's actually not that the fiber itself is any cheaper. Actually, multi-mode is more expensive than single mode. It's that it lets you work with cheaper optics. So if you've only got a really short distance to go, you can work with something that is less precise, less focused, less aim, less calibrated, um, you know, might have, have, have uh, more variance with temperature, things like that. Uh, but it does this at the expense of, of reach. Um, so multi-mode fiber is named that because it allows multiple modes of light to propagate. Um, and that causes modal distortions. We'll talk more about this. But uh, that basically, you're never going to get more than tens to hundreds of meters on a multi-mode system. Uh, maybe uh, slightly longer than that if you go back to you know, 100 meg technology. Uh, but that's, that's about what you get in multi-mode. So there's two main types of multi-mode out there. Uh, there's the classic OM1 and OM2, uh, basically FIDI grade. This came out with the you know, 100 meg, 
100 meg fiber. Uh, you'll find this with orange jackets. Uh, so OM1 is kind of your classic 62.5 micron core, OM2 has a 50 micron core. They have very similar performance, OM2 is slightly better. Uh, this was really designed, like I said, for FIDI, for 100 meg signals uh, at 1310, and it really starts to become a problem at, at 10 gig speeds. So you start to get distances of you know, 26 meters, which doesn't really cross a cross connect. Um, OM3 and 4 is the more modern stuff, and that's called laser optimized. Uh, and you'll see that with aqua jackets, this light blue color. Uh, and it's specifically designed to do modern high bandwidth systems, uh, laser systems that are, that are sending at 850 nanometer. Uh, so it supports 10 gig signals much better. Uh, you get 300 to 500 meters uh, instead of you know, 20s, things like that. And it's basically required for 40 and 100. Um, and th I'll talk more about this later, but 40 is, is, there's really no such thing as 40 gig E, it's four by 10. And there's really no such thing as 100 gig E, it's four by 28. Uh, so it starts to, to send those, uh, those signals 100 meters and, and makes it much cheaper. Single mode is what you use whenever you want to do something that is truly high bandwidth and truly long distance. It has a much smaller core uh, between 8 to 10 microns, and there's no inherent distance limitations caused by modal distortions. So you can easily take the signal, send it several thousand kilometers, uh, I've seen 9,000 kilometer systems uh, on some, some undersea stuff. Uh, and all you have to do is keep regenerating the light, but you don't have to completely re-encode this signal. You don't have to put a new modem on the end uh, and, and do an OEO conversion. Uh, if you're not doing amplification, you'll typically see distances somewhere in the 80 kilometer range, and they can be higher or lower depending on a lot of different factors. Uh, but you, could, you can generally expect those types of distances. And single mode has an even broader array of, of types than multi-mode. Um, so there is a, you know, like there's an OM1 and an OM2, there's an OS1 and an OS2. It doesn't quite mean the same thing in single mode. So OS1 is basically tight buffered cable that you would find for indoor use. An OS2 is the loose cable that you would see. So in, a, in an underground duct, they don't run it, they blow it in. So you need this very loose cable to be blown in. Um, you'll see classic SMF called something called, something called SMF 28. Uh, it was a Corning product name, but it kind of became the, the standard baseline of kind of classic old fiber. Uh, but there's a lot of different types out there now. There's low water peak, dispersion shifted, non-zero dispersion shifted, bend and sensitive, and many other different variants, and many different standards to define this. So a quick word about modal distortion in multi in multimode. Uh, you see here a um, couple different beams of light coming in, and you see the, the two that are accepted, uh, they propagate at different speeds, at different rates. The, the core is so wide that it allows this to happen, and that's basically what you're seeing in modal distortion. That's why you, you get that limit uh, with multi-mode. Um, there's a thing out there called a mode conditioning cable. Uh, it pretty much, I think technically it exists for 10 gig too. It was a thing around one gig when you wanted to take your LX on a, on a multi-mode and go slightly further. Uh, I think it, it's still technically possible to use it for like LRM and, and uh, LX4 for 10 gig, things that you, you don't see that often these days. Uh, and it basically has no use after that. But essentially what it is, is it's a, a fiber, it's a factory made fusion splice where they set a precise angle between the, the multi-mode and the single mode uh, so that you send the signal in at just the right angle to limit the modal distortions. Uh, so you might put this special patch cable in and it will turn your distance from what would have been 300 meters to 550 meters, something like that. So if you ever see that or if you ever see the, the fiber uh, with two mismatched types joined, you know what that is. I have a little table here, what happens if you do various combinations of things that you shouldn't do. Um, so if you take a, an old light source, something like Gigi SX or FIDI, something that's a, an LED uh, source, and you send it down multi-mode fiber, you get exactly what you would expect. You get, you're limited by modal distortion, uh, you'll get a few hundred feet, and that's it. If you send it down single-mode fiber, it'll work, but you're, you're basically limited by attenuation. You're, you're blocking out 90% of the signal because you've got a much smaller core. So I've seen people use this for like one meter patch cables in a pinch and it will work. Uh, be aware that you can do that. Be aware that it'll probably break at really bad times and you shouldn't do that. If you've got a laser source um, and you send it down the multi-mode fiber, you're basically gonna always do as well as you would uh, without that uh, and potentially better. 
so that's always the option. And then really what you want if you've got a laser source, a modern laser source and single mode fiber, that's how you get these, these long distance links. So now I'm gonna talk a lot about optical networking terms and concepts. Start with optical power. So what is optical power? It's really just the brightness or the intensity of the light. So the way this works is as light travels through fiber, it's gonna lose some of its brightness. Uh, it's, some of it's gonna be absorbed by glass particles, converted into heat, it's gonna be scattered, there's gonna be microscopic imperfections in the fiber. Um, just over, over some distance, you're going to lose intensity of the light, and that loss of intensity is called attenuation. And we measure that in decibels, just like the, the same scale for, uh, for sound. And a decibel is one-tenth of a bell, which is a logarithmic scale unit expressing a relationship between two values. So it's what's called a dimensionless unit. It doesn't actually say anything on its own. So if I said 10 decibels, that doesn't mean anything inherently. All that means is that it's 10 times more than something. So yeah, like I said here, um, minus 10 dB is one-tenth the signal, minus 20 dB is one one-hundredth the signal. You can see it's a, a logarithmic scale. Another easy one to remember uh, is that plus 3, B, plus 3 dB is about double and minus 3 dB is about half. Uh, but it doesn't tell you double or half of what. So when you want to express an absolute value, you need a reference. And in optical networking, that's called the dBm. That's a decibel relative to one milliwatt of power. So for example, zero dBm is one milliwatt of power. Three dBm is two milliwatts. Minus three is 0.5, exactly what I said before. But this is probably one of the single biggest areas that, that people screw up. So anyone who's ever working a light meter, if you've got a data center tech who's telling you that they're receiving a certain amount of signal and you're like, mm, I don't think the Death Star is out today. Uh, that's probably why they're, they're in the wrong mode. They don't know how to read this. So be sure you, you see and understand the distinction between the two. So why do we actually measure light in decibels? Um, light, just like sound, follows what's called the inverse square law. Uh, so it's inversely proportional to the distance squared. What that means is if the signal travels distance x, it loses half its intensity. If it travels distance x again, it loses another half of its intensity. So at 2x, you're down to 25%. At 3x, you're down to 12.5%. Uh, it follows a logarithmic scale. So when you use a logarithmic scale to, to express this, basically what it does is it, it turns the math into something really simple. Instead of having to do the math and figure out is it 25, is it 12.5? You can do really simple addition, subtraction, really basic multiplication. You know that a distance of 2x is 6 dB and a distance of 3x is 9 dB, things like that. And it makes it easier on the humans and people who are generally bad at math. So I have a little table in here that you can look up after. Uh, it just kind of has a, a table of what the, the conversion is. Uh, but you can see that once you start to get into the, the minus 25 dB range, that's when you're, you're down to like no signal left, and that usually means you're, you're shot and toast. Uh, and you know, minus 50 is completely black. Um, there's a concept in optical networking called dispersion. So dispersion basically just means to spread out, um, and when you do that on an optical signal, that results in signal degradation. So there's two main types of dispersion that you have to worry about. Uh, the first is called chromatic dispersion. And the cause for that is different frequencies of light will propagate through that non-vacuum medium, because remember, fiber is not a vacuum. Uh, different frequencies will propagate at different speeds. So after you've gone some length of distance, um, you're able to, you know, the, the, the lower frequency is propagated at a different speed than the higher frequency. That's actually how optical prisms work. If you look at the, the triangle shape and you see the light coming through, it's passing through um, more material. That's what's causing that to, to spread out. And the other one's called polarization mode dispersion. And that's caused by the, the fiber itself is just not perfectly round. It's, uh, it, they try to make it as cylindrical as possible, but it's impossible to get it perfect. Uh, and so what you'll see is one polarization of light will propagate faster than the other. Uh, and a lot of older fiber is especially affected by this and can get worse with age. Uh, a lot of uh, frost thaw cycles will cause the fiber to kind of be pushed around and, and misshapen in weird ways. So there's a lot of people out there who have fiber from the early, early 80s deployed that can't do more than you know 2.5 gigs on it because it's of all these types of, of issues. 
So here's a little picture showing the effects of dispersion. Uh, and you can see that as the, the signal is spread out, as it's smeared, that you're no longer able to clearly see a one or a zero. You've just got this mush and you don't know what's happening. That's the problem you're dealing with with dispersion. Uh, there's a couple fiber optic transmission bands that you need to know about. Uh, they're called windows. So the first window is 850 nanometer, and it's the highest attenuation, it's the shortest, it's used for short reach applications, it's the, it's the stuff that you see for tens, maybe hundreds of meters. Um, the next one is the second window, O-band, around 1310, and it's the point where zero, the point of zero dispersion in classic SMF, uh, but it had higher attenuation. So you'll see that today for kind of medium, medium reach applications, your, your 10 kilometer optics tend to be centered around that or that specifically. Um, the third window, the C-band, that's the one that you'll see used most commonly, especially in, in our world. Uh, it stands for the conventional band, and it covers a, a spectrum from 1525 to 1565. It has the lowest rate of attenuation over SMF, uh, and it's also the region where a certain type of amplifier works. I'll talk more about that in a bit, but this is basically what you see used for all your long haul, all your, your any, almost everything that we deal with fits in C-band. And then you've got uh, the fourth window, the L-band, uh, and there's some more spectrum beyond the C-band that typically only gets reserved for more exotic stuff, so submarine systems, very specific things. Uh, there's some modern gear out there that, that's starting to get more into it, but mostly you'll see things deployed in C-band uh, for any type of, of serious stuff. So here's a little picture showing the evolution of the, the fiber itself. Um, so the, the top line, you can see kind of the, the fiber in the early 80s. And what you're seeing here is what's called water peak. Um, so there's, there's certain frequencies that don't propagate well through fiber uh, just because it's absorbed by hydroxyl molecules that, that get into the glass. And as the fiber production has gotten better and better, the more modern fiber out there is better able to uh, to deal with that, but you can kind of see these windows and why they were picked around the different limitations out there uh, of the, the water peak. And you never know when you're deploying a network, you might be in fiber that was laid last month that is the latest and greatest hotness, uh, or you might be running over someone's fiber from 20 years ago that's a hot mess. Um, so we talk a little bit about wave vision multiplexing. So wave division multiplexing, we all know that light comes in many different colors. Uh, so you know when you see white light, there, there's no such thing as white, you're seeing a mix of all these different colors. Um, you can actually put different colors of light on the same fiber and increase your, your bandwidth. And the goal here is, is to have these things passing each other without interfering. So you could take 50 different colors of light, put them all on the same piece of glass, uh, and have them pass each other, ships in the night style, increasing capacity but not interfering each other. That's what you're, you're looking to do with WDM. So there's a couple different types of WDM out there. Uh, the most common ones you'll hear about are DWDM and CWDM, dense and coarse. And they basically do the same thing in the same way, but the channel spacing is a lot different. Uh, so here's a little picture showing kind of a, uh, a classic CWDM spacing, uh, which you might get like eight channels uh, on, a, on a fiber to work with relative to a 200 gigahertz, which is actually really old. That's like 2000 era technology uh, for DWDM. So you can see that DWDM is a lot more efficient uh, and there's a lot of systems out there that are a tenth of that size at this point. So CWDM doesn't, it doesn't have that many standards behind it. Uh, it's basically loosely used to mean anything that's not DWDM. So here's a, a classic example of a you know, popular definition, 20 nanometer spacing, eight channels. Simple, cheap, if you just wanted to run a handful of, of wavelengths. Uh, the goal there is to just kind of bring down cost and make it, make it easy. Um, the reason that, that CWDM is cheaper is not because the signal itself is any wider, it's because the tolerances have to be less. The, the laser, as it heats up and cools down, will start to waver on where, it, where it's sending, and it has a much wider range to waver over. Uh, so it's much, much cheaper to produce. Uh, if you've got low water peak fiber, there's another 10 channels. There's, there's all this different uh, spectrum down low. Um, it could also be used to refer to something as simple as a 1310, 1550 mux. There's a, CWDM basically means anything you want it to mean. DWDM is the one that is the real standard. 
uh, it's defined by an ITU standard, ITUT standard, uh, and it's called a grid. So there's many different grids out there. Um, you'll, see it, you'll see it expressed in gigahertz. That's referring to the, the size of the channel. Um, so in C-band, here's a, a classic example, a 200 gigahertz system. Um, you would get 20 channels. You get kind of 1.6 nanometer spacing. You go down to 100 gigahertz, you're down into the, the 0.8 spacing, you're up to 40 channels. You go down to 50, you get up to 80 channels. You, you see the progression there. And those are kind of the deployed systems that are out there in the, in the wild today. So basically, you can think right now, 200 gigahertz is kind of old 2000 era technology that you don't see deployed anymore. Um, 100 gigahertz is still quite common uh, for really cheap stuff, like if you just go to China, buy a whole bunch of, of cheap commodity uh, metro 10 gig stuff, uh, it's all still largely based around 100. It's the, it's the cheapest system to make. You can, you can buy a, a 40 channel MUX for 1,000 bucks. Um, it's, it's really easy to work with. Uh, 50 gigahertz is a lot more common, both in the, the commercial, the, the high end, the long haul systems, the 100 gig systems kind of uh, use those today. Uh, you might start to see in the future as technology progresses, as we start moving to 400 gig and things like that, uh, that they're going to start requiring more channels. So they're going to start to go back to the, the 100 gigahertz channels. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But uh, 25 was a, was a technology that was used largely at the, the era where we were kind of capped at 10 gig, where we didn't know how to get past large numbers of 10 gig. So we, we got it down to 25 gigahertz, we got it to 160 10 gig channels. And nowadays what you see is with the, the evolution of, of moving to native 100 gig and beyond optical signals, you're back into the 50 gigahertz spacing. So 25, even though it's tighter, is more, more of an older system at this point. So what are the advantages? Uh, like I said, CWDM is, is cheaper. You can use less precise lasers. Um, like I said, the, the signal itself isn't any wider. It just lets you deal with wider temperature variations and have to put in as, as nice, as well-tested, expensive, well-cooled components. Uh, but DVDM lets you have a lot more channels on the fiber. Uh, so you know, you're up to 160 channels at 25 gigahertz in 32 nanometers of spectrum versus eight channels in 160 nanometers. Uh, the nice thing about DWDM is you can stay completely in the C-band, get a lot of channels, and the C-band is where what's called an EDFA, an erbium-doped amplifier works. And I'll talk more about that later, uh, but it's basically a, a simple, easy way to make the light brighter over this particular piece of spectrum. So here's another picture kind of showing some of the, the relative sizes, so you get an appreciation of, of what's out there, um, the different DWDMs versus a single CWDM channel. Uh, there's a couple other uses for wave division multiplexing. Uh, so like I said, there's, there's a, a really simple, cheap, you can buy them for not much money at all, way to, to take a 1310 and a 1550, the two most common gray optics, um, and, and put them together and just kind of double your bandwidth on a single strand. That's an easy, cheap way for people to, to do some quick fixes. Um, there's a lot of four-lane gray optics at this point. Um, so sometimes it's actually cheaper and easier to just, instead of coming up with a, a real native 100 gig signal, which at this point we don't have the, we do have the technology to do it, but it's, it's a much more prohibitively expensive system. Uh, it, it's much easier to go with 4x25 uh, or 28, depending on how you look at the overhead, um, different lanes. So when 10 gig came out, you saw the same thing. You saw that it was, for a while, much cheaper and easier to implement a 4x2.5 gig channel than it was to make a, a native 1x10. And over time, you saw that start to change. It actually became more expensive to make the, the 4x system because you've got to have all the gearboxes and the, the Serdes and all the stuff to deal with it. The, the lanes have to kind of come that way natively from the board or it doesn't make sense. Uh, so eventually, people standardize on, on newer types of optics that don't have those issues, and, and you see the, the four-lane system kind of go away. Uh, but right now, in the world of 40 gig E, um, it's almost all four, it's, it's essentially it's all four by 10. There's, there's really no such thing in 40 gig E as 40 gig, it's all four by 10, which makes it really easy to take and split out into four different 10 gig signals. Uh, but SR4, LR4, ER4, whatever it is, it's a, it's a four by 10. 100 gig is, is basically doing the same thing. Uh, when it first came out, you actually saw a lot of 10 by 10. You saw SR10 technologies out there. Now you're seeing the, the move to kind of, of 4 by 25. Um, that's going to be true for probably another few years, and eventually the technology will get there to, 
to not need to do that, but we're, we're still a ways off from that. Uh, so you'll, you'll see that these don't fit in any kind of classic grid. So for example, um, you know, 40 giggy or 100 giggy kind of use this 1295.6, 1300.1 spacing, um, but you know, they, they follow a, an MSA standard. Um, you also see some single strand optics. So people will make the MUX integrated all the way into the optic. So you don't have to have an external box doing anything. And literally all it does is kind of uh, let you use a single strand of fiber instead of two, send two different colors, one going one way, one going the other. Um, so that can be a really simple, easy, cheap way to kind of double your bandwidth just by replacing an optic without having to install gear, rack anything, cable anything. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the WDM networking components themselves. So we'll start with the MUX, the, the, the MUX, the DMUX, the multiplexer. Uh, you'll see this called a filter or a prism. So the term filter is how it actually works, uh, but the term prism is kind of what people are used to when they think about something that splits light into different colors. Uh, so you'll hear both names. Uh, it's a really simple device. All it does is combine multiple colors of light onto a single fiber. It's completely passive, doesn't require any power. It's just, uh, I'll go into more about the construction, but really simple, easy thing, and you can have a, a one use system that, to do 40 channels, and you're really only limited by how many ports you can put in that one use of uh, a faceplate space. Um, but it's a, a complete system. Uh, you need a MUX and a DMUX, so you need two sides of this, and these days, most of the modern gear is, is gonna support both in both directions, uh, but it's essentially, you know, when you buy the one you box, it's two different components all added in there going different directions. Um, like I said, it's two distinct components. So how a MUX actually works, uh, it's based on what's called an optical bandpass filter. So usually you'll see something like a, a Bragg rating filter, uh, and what this does is it will reflect certain frequencies and pass the rest through. And I'll talk more about kind of the other components that are used later on, but basically you, you know that this one channel, this one specific frequency, you're gonna send a different direction, and you use that to, to build a MUX and send out different, uh, one frequency to this port, one frequency to that port. Um, that's basically all you're doing. Uh, the next concept is called an OADM, an optical add drop multiplexer. And what you're doing here is you're selectively adding or dropping certain channels while passing other channels through. So in this example, I think I'm adding and dropping, what am I dropping one and five and passing two, three, and four. Uh, so it, it lets you build optical rings, optical top, different optical topologies, uh, and you don't have to drop every channel at every place. You can say these are, some of these channels are express channels, they're just gonna sail through, go on to the next node, and some of these channels we're actually gonna drop and, and interface with gear in our, our pop here. Uh, so a well-constructed OADM ring, you can do things like you can reuse the same wavelength on different sides of the ring in different parts. Uh, you, can, you can build some really complex optical topologies there. But um, This is kind of showing a, a classic OADM or sometimes called an FOADM, a fixed OADM, uh, because the modern world mostly is built with rotoms. So rotom is the exact same thing, but it's reconfigurable. It's essentially nothing more than a software-tunable OADM. Um, Apparently I left an extra line in there. Uh, so it just allows you to control what channels are dropped and passed through uh, and increase channel flexibility. So you don't, you don't need to buy a specific component, rack it, install it, cable it, and know that it will only drop these four channels ever for life. You can grow and, and change your topology over time and just log into the box and change the channels that you wanna drop. Um, so you can build some more complex optical topologies. And at this point, all the rotoms are, are multi-degree. You can build things other than simple rings, other than just straight east-west. Um, and we're starting to see now kind of a, a second generation evolution of rotoms come along. So in, in the world of a basic rotom, the way that it works is you've got what's called a WSS, a wavelength selectable switch. And it's steering the light down a certain way. And basically what you're, what you're having happen is the rotom steers it towards a, a mux, towards the same old classic mux that you always used. And that same old classic mux had the channel routed, a specific channel routed to a specific port, and you plugged a specific cable into that. It worked, it worked relatively well. Uh, but every time you wanna change something, you've gotta send a tech out there to move a cable around. Um, that becomes really difficult to do. You, you can't do responsive things to, to different fiber cuts and failures, um, things like that. And it just, it becomes a lot of human resource intensive. So the next evolution was the colorless rotom. 
So that's kind of integrating the, the MUX in such a way that you don't have port one is reserved for channel one and port two is reserved for channel two. You can now take any port and send it any color you want, but it was still very limited. You, you could only send a specific degree to a specific MUX and a specific set of ports. And the latest evolution in Rotoms is what's called CDC, colorless, directionless, and contentionless. So colorless means, like I said before, any channel can be dropped on any port. Uh, so you, if you decide that you want channel one today and channel 27 tomorrow, you just log into a router, you log into a box somewhere and change it. Uh, you don't have to, to do any recabling work. It's directionless because it can be sent in any direction. So you see in, in this example, uh, you, you don't only have to send it out this left direction here, you can send it uh, any port, anywhere, anytime. And it's contentionless because in some of these rodent designs, there were inherent limitations in the number of times you could use the frequency inside of the rotom. And the, the modern systems don't have that limitation. So you can, as long as the channel is open on that direction, you can send it there. And these are much more expensive than, than classic rotoms, but they allow a lot more flexibility. Um, uh, some slight duplicate information here, but really the, the goal here, what you're, what you're after, is to eliminate the need to physically move cables, and this lets you do dynamic bandwidth provisioning on demand at an optical level. So there's a lot of work going on right now in the IETF. Um, there's a, a protocol called PCAP, Path Computation Element Protocol. Uh, works today with, with MPLS, uh, where you can say dynamically, oh, at this time of day, I know that I need more capacity on this path. Uh, rather than have to go purchase a whole second modem and depreciate it over the, the course of years and, and hope that my traffic balance is right, I can use the exact same transponder for one path during one part of the day and a different path during a different part of the day or respond to network failures, move things around. The latency might be slightly higher, but the, the bandwidth is still there. So there's a, a lot of, there's some people that are actually deploying this in production now uh, and it, to, to great effect. So a lot of automation going on in, in the world of networking. Um, it's kind of complicated though, and you actually start to look at what's happening inside here. So here's kind of the architecture of a, a CDC rotom, and you'll see what's happening is you've got a, a 1 by 20 WSS, a wavelength selectable switch. You're actually amplifying every one of these channels, so there's a whole bunch of, of amplifiers inside the rotom itself. And then you've got an 8 by 16 multicast switch. Uh, so there's a, there's a technique called filtering. Basically, you, you multicast this signal to every port, you amplify it, and then you filter down to just the frequencies that you want. And it makes this really weird, complex system, but it does make it completely software reconfigurable, which is kind of nice. Um, some of the more modern stuff that's going on, by modern, I mean the last few years, but this is, this is stuff that you're going to start to see more and more. Um, there's a concept called super channels. So when you're trying to deploy large amounts of, of bandwidth right now, uh, currently let's say you want to deploy a terabit of capacity from point A to point B. The way that you might do that would be 10 different 100 gig channels. Uh, and the way channels work on an ordinary channel in a 50 gigahertz spectrum, um, there's what's called a guard band. There's a little bit of space that's left between your signal and where the next person's signal is going to start so the two don't overlap. Uh, because the, the MUX itself, the filter isn't like a hard, precise line. It kind of, it, it gets more and more attenuation as it moves into that different frequency. So you need this spacing to build this, this clean separation. And that starts to eat up a lot of, of spectrum. So when you're trying to build, for example, here, uh, a 500 gig system, you can do it, instead of doing it in, uh, in, in, 50, in 500 gigahertz of channels, uh, instead of doing it in, no, let me show you here, um, in, in 500 gigahertz of channels, you can do it in 375. You're kind of squeezing them together, treating them as one distinct unit, and operating multiple carriers. The reason to do multiple carriers is kind of like I, I said before with the four lane stuff, there's a limit in what the technology can do. There's, there's no way to do terabit optical today, it's just not possible. So when you wanna move a terabit and you wanna treat it as though it's a, a terabit link, um, you, can, you can bundle this together, build it with 10 different uh, subcarriers, uh, and do that with technology that exists today instead of waiting for several years. And the other thing you're starting to see uh, in the evolution of DWDM is what's called flex grid or gridless. So essentially, you, you look at a 50 gigahertz grid and you might see that there's a lot of different 
requirements out there. There's some old 10 gig, 10 gig systems that are fit perfectly fine in 25 gigahertz. There's some modern stuff that fits in 50. And now we're starting to see people are, are asking, how are we gonna do 400 gig? How are we gonna do terabit systems? Uh, and the answer that the optical industry has been coming up with is, let's get rid of this fixed grid system and having to make, make everything fit in this perfect grid and make it completely flexible. Uh, so you can, you can go all the way down to, at this point, 12.5 gigahertz granularity, and you can mix and match. You can make one channel that's much larger, one channel that's much smaller, um, use the spectrum however you want. And if you're deploying a, a modern system right now today, this is the type of gear that you'd be putting in. So you're gonna start to see networks do that, that refresh of their common op optical infrastructure over time. Uh, some more optical networking concepts. I told you I'd hit all them all. Amplifiers. So an optical amplifier uh, is used to increase the intensity of the signal. Uh, there's a couple different types out there. The one that most of the router industry will, will deal with is what's called the EDFA, the Erbium Dope Fiber Amplifier. Um, there's other stuff out there. There's Raman amps. Uh, there's hybrid where you're kind of doing multiple Raman and, and, uh, and EDFA amps together. Uh, there's all kinds of more complex things that you can do. But for most of the, especially in metro stuff and for, for more simple router-based stuff, uh, you're mostly dealing with an EDFA. What happens here is you've got a, a piece of fiber that is doped with erbium ions. And you've got a, a coupler and you inject a laser signal at a completely different frequency. So you pump in laser uh, at 980 or 1480 nanometers. And what happens is an interaction between the erbium and the pump laser causes the light to get brighter in C-band. Don't ask me how any of that works, physics. Uh, there's a thing called optical switches. So these let you kind of steer light around without having to do the OEO conversion. So when you think about a router and a pluggable in it, what you're doing is converting that from an optical signal back to electric, routing it to the other side of the face plate, and then turning it back into an optical signal and sending it back out. And that can work, but that can be very inefficient as well. Uh, so in some cases, you just wanna directly take that optical signal and, and redirect it, switch it to somewhere different. Um, and a lot of what's happening here is what's called 3D MIMS technology, uh, basically just a, an array of these mirrors. So a lot of systems right now are kind of 192 by 192 grids, uh, where you can take any particular fiber port and redirect it to any other fiber port uh, instantly, essentially, uh, within, within milliseconds. Um, so you, you move these tiny little mirrors around with static electricity and it sends the signal exactly where you want. Uh, it works well for optical cross connects, for fiber protection. Uh, they're used inside of, of Rotoms as a WSS. Uh, there's all kinds of, of advancements in this technology. It's also real, really expensive. Uh, a lot of people use it, like if you've got a really high budget and nothing better to do with it, a lot of people will use it in their labs to simplify the cabling, make everything look nice and pretty. Uh, so you might put in these, these 50 gram boxes just to do cable management. A circulator is a, an internal component that you'll never see standalone, but you should kind of know what it is. It's basically used to implement something. So for example, a, a MUX or an OADM dispersion compensation. What a circulator is, is it has three ports. And when light comes in port one, it goes out port two. And when light comes in port two, it goes out port three. So here you see an example of a, an OADM where you've got a Bragg grading filter. Uh, you, you bounce a certain frequency of light through and that causes it to drop. Uh, and if you didn't bounce it, then you pass it through. So that's, that's an internal component that's used to kind of build these, these muxes. There's a lot of splitters and optical taps out there. Uh, they do exactly what they sound like they do. They, they split the signal. Um, there's a couple different cool things that you can do with these. So one is a 50-50 splitter. So where you, you'll typically see this used is really simple optical protection. So let's say you've got two pieces of fiber and you, you've got a span. It could be a single simple span. It could be uh, it could be a, a really complex WDM system. If you don't want to go through the, the trouble, the difficulty, the expense of actually using that to build into your system, you can slap a 50-50 splitter in front of it, send the signal down both directions, and then you've got gear on the other side that's basically just a light meter looking for which side is stronger. And if one side drops off, it switches to working with the other. Uh, so it gives you a really simple, easy way to kind of get cheap fiber protection uh, without having to, to put a lot in. And you, know, you can do this at very high data rates. 
uh, and, and not double the cost of your transceivers and things like that that could otherwise be very expensive. The other one that you'll see uh, is what's called a 99-1 splitter. Uh, so these gets used in, uh, in optical performance monitoring. So sometimes what you want to do is just take 1% of the signal, split it off, send it to a little meter that you can log into and look at it, and you can see what channel, what the power levels are, what, what's, what's happening on your fiber. Uh, so you can just easily split off that, that one small piece of it. Forward error correction uh, starting to become more and more pervasive. Uh, so FEC is essentially what you're doing is you're adding extra redundant information to the transmission so that you can computationally recover from error. So think of it like RAID 5 for your, for your optics. Um, in practice, what you're doing here is you're, you're working with a worse OSNR, you're able to improve the receiver sensitivity in ways that might otherwise be unusable. So for example, uh, you could take a, a 10 gig signal. So a 10 gigi actually transmitted across the line is 10.325. Uh, and if you pad that up 7% to 11 gigs, uh, you might take what used to be an 80 kilometer wavelength and turn it into 120 or more uh, just by adding that extra little 7% of overhead. Um, so you're actually starting to see a lot of, of WDM systems. The, the reason you, you care about this more and more is as you upgrade, as, as technology gets upgraded and as people start overhauling their WDM systems, um, some of the, you know, what you would want in an ideal build, you won't get. You won't get the perfect hut spacing, you won't get all of these things, uh, and you're not gonna go re redeploy your huts uh, so they can be 10 kilometers closer so you get better OSNR. Uh, so you, you start to turn to software solutions like this to kind of get what you want. Uh, there's a, a third generation FEC system called uh, SD FEC, Soft Decision FEC. Uh, and you're up to 20% of overhead, but you're able to gain that critical one to two dB of efficiency. Uh, and that can be the, the difference in actually getting a, a 200 gig signal to work uh, over any kind of distance. And you're even starting to see FEC now all the way down to the common pluggable. So for example, when you go buy a couple hundred dollar, 100 gig SR4 optic, it actually requires FEC. It requires that the host, as part of that standard, does FEC. Um, CWDM4, things like that, uh, and you're able to get, get longer distances out of it. So here's a, a chart kind of showing the benefits. Uh, you can see the, the, the drop off here. Uh, so where the drop off uh, in, in OSNR, as it gets worse and worse, uh, the, the error level becomes unusable, as it you know, is really, really bad uh, for, for uh, uncoded stuff. You get this significant cliff, you get the significant improvement in, in how much further you can go without errors. Uh, there's another technology called G709, OTN Digital Wrappers. So OTN stands for Optical Transport Network. Um, it's a set of standards that let you do interoperability at an optical level across different protocols. So for example, when the, the very first 10 gig systems were deployed, they actually weren't 10 gig E systems, they were OC192 systems. They all expected OC192, that was all, the only thing they knew about. And even though 10 gig was really close, they're almost the same speed, they're almost the compatible, um, a lot of the gear that was out there and deployed for those first 10 gig systems couldn't work with that. So you had all these weird workarounds. You had you had thing called uh, WAN fire where you would take a, a 10 gig signal, a 10 gig E signal and stick it inside a, uh, an OC192 wrapper and make it look like OC192 uh, and you lose 10% of the bandwidth in the process. Uh, so OTN kind of lets you do this type of, of interoperability at an optical level and not need to have gear that knows about everything at all times. So basically you, you take whatever the signal is, be it Sonnet, ATM, I'm sure someone still has ATM somewhere, Giggy, IP, whatever, whatever they're trying to do. Um, fiber channel stuff, uh, and you, you slap a wrapper around it, and so the, the transport gear now knows what this is. It knows what it, what it needs, what it, where it should go, um, what it looks like. Um, and you see a lot of this used to do stuff like, for example, Ethernet was, was never designed to be a long haul protocol. It was designed to plug in your, your computer to the wall or something. So the, uh, the protocol itself is actually really terrible at troubleshooting. If you ever worked with, with Sonnet compared to Ethernet, you go, oh, Sonnet's so much nicer, but it's hideously more expensive because Ethernet has such market share. So you're able to take these, these technologies that were never intended to do this, slap an OTN wrapper around it, and now work with Ethernet as though it was a, a protocol that was actually meant to build a, a WAN. 
So now I'm gonna talk some about different types of single mode fiber. So I already discussed single mode fiber is essentially used for all the, the long reach applications, um, but there's a lot of different types out there. There's standard single mode, low water peak, dispersion shifted, low, uh, low loss fiber, um, non-zero dispersion shifted, and we'll kind of talk about all these. So the, the standard single mode fiber, this is what you saw deployed in the very first generation of fiber builds out there. Um, you'll frequently hear it called SMF28 because that was the, the corning product at the time. Um, it, you could also be called an NDSF, a non-dispersion shifted fiber. It's really optimized for use around 1310. Uh, it has the lowest rate of dispersion there. It was designed before the deployment of WDM. Like no one, no one thought about WDM at the time. Uh, they were thinking about 1310 signals. Uh, then there's something called low water peak. And basically that is just a, a standard that removes those hydroxyl molecules that can get in the glass, kind of get rid of that, that peak where um, hydrogen will absorb different frequencies and, and kind of make the spectrum unusable. So you see on the left, this is the light that hydrogen will absorb when it's, when it's in the fiber uh, and how you kind of get, get that water peak away and can start to work with the fiber there, the spectrum there. Um, so then they started to work on something kind of uh, the, the early generation WDM stuff. Uh, there was a technology called dispersion shifted fiber. And the attempt here was to improve the, the rate of dispersion because dispersion was a huge problem that people didn't know how to, how to deal with. Uh, and they said, let's, let's try to move the point of zero dispersion uh, over to the 1550 range where before it was in the 1310. So an attempt to make chromatic dispersion less bad they shifted it to 1550. Uh, it turns out this didn't work really well at all. So there's a whole bunch of physics that I won't even begin to understand, but essentially there, there's something called uh, nonlinearities. Um, one of the most common ones is something called four wave mixing. So when you moved the point of, not, of, of zero dispersion right into the smack center of what you were talking about, uh, you could have, for example, three equally spaced wavelengths that would interact with each other to produce a fourth harmonic and you couldn't put anything on that fourth channel, it would make it unusable. Uh, so this fiber, it, it rarely used today, it's kind of impossible to work with on a, a modern WDM system, but it was a standard, it was something people tried to deploy and they thought that it was gonna be a good thing and it turned out not to be. So the solution to this was something called non-zero dispersion shifted fiber. So basically the same thing, but instead of putting it, the, the point of, of zero dispersion right in 1550, they moved it just outside and they make two different types of fiber called two different slopes. So one will make the light spread out as it goes through it, and the other will make the light spread in as it goes through it. And so you can switch the types of fiber back and forth and kind of try to keep that chromatic dispersion limited. Um, so I'll talk more about how that gets used later. Uh, so some other single mode fiber types, there's low attenuation fiber. Um, so for example, when you've got a, a, an undersea cable system, you've got something that you really, you, you can't easily add more amps, you can't service it, you can't do anything, and you've got this very long span that you don't wanna have, you don't wanna have your, your transponders underwater. Um, you've got these very low power uh, amplifiers. Uh, you need very low attenuation fiber to, to work with that above all of their properties. Um, you've got G657, and there's like a dozen different substandards inside of here, uh, but it's something called bend insensitive fiber. So this is mostly what you'll see in your patch cables in your data center. Uh, it's what like, you take, take your fiber, bend it like this, and not break it or not do anything. Um, it has a, a, a much, much better bend radius, so you can kind of fiddle around with it and not have to be as precise. Uh, but the, the stuff that's underground isn't that, because uh, it's not getting bent inside the conduit. Uh, remember, modern fibers are generally much better than the spec. Um, so a lot of these, these specs were, were very old, uh, and, and the stuff that you can buy now, if you're actually buying big spools of fiber and laying it yourself, is much nicer. Uh, but remember, there's a lot of old fiber in the ground, too. So you never quite know what you're going to work with, especially when you're dealing with it at a, at a network level. So here's a little graph showing some of the different dispersion rates of, of these commercial fiber systems that were uh, intended to, to deal with dispersion. You see the different slopes and, and how they work. Uh, but they, they move that point of zero to just outside of, of the C-band there. Uh, so now we're gonna talk more about engineering and optical network. Oh, and I should have mentioned uh, 
in the previous slide. So a lot of this doesn't matter anymore because the, the more modern systems, I'll talk more about it later, but the, the more modern coherent technologies don't even care about dispersion anymore. We've gotten so good at fixing it electronically that it's actually better if you just don't try to compensate for it at all. Uh, so a lot of this was, was stuff that mattered 10 years ago that doesn't matter today. So I'm gonna talk more about engineering and optical network. There's a concept called insertion loss. And that means even the best connectors and splices, uh, nothing's perfect, and any time you connect two fibers together, you get loss. So you might see a budgetary figure of something like 0 0.5 dB per connector, and it's probably much less than that if you clean it precisely, swab the tip, get it in just right, make sure it's well connected, it's probably much better than that. And if your friendly Equinix tech spits on it, rubs it on his t-shirt, slaps it in there, doesn't hear it click, might be much worse than that. Uh, so you kind of budget for, for real world conditions. Uh, insertion loss is also used to de describe the loss from a MUX. It's basically the penalty that you pay just for inserting the fiber, so it's called insertion loss. Uh, so kind of here's some real life examples. Uh, you might see, and this used to be much worse, if you look 10 years ago at the technology, uh, a 40 channel 100 gigahertz system might have had an insertion loss of, of closer to 10 dB, and the, the more modern technology has, has gotten uh, you're able to get that down. But when you go to a, an 80 channel, when you go to a 50 gigahertz system, there's a pretty high insertion loss just for, for plugging in that, that MUX. Uh, and then you have to start amplifying. And then here's a kind of a diagram showing some of the bad things that could happen when you've got mismatched core sizes or the cores aren't aligned. And I don't know what happened to the picture with the fiber with the air gap. Apparently it's really, really air gappy. Uh, so when you work with this, you, you kind of need to, to plan, you need to have a, an optical budget. So when an optic says 40 kilometers on it, that is a rough guideline. That doesn't mean you're actually gonna get 40 kilometers. You might actually get much better. Uh, you might actually get much worse. It, it entirely depends. Uh, you could have a straight shot where you could get 60 kilometers on a 40 kilometer optic, and you could have, uh, you know, leaving 111.8 where you go through 57 patch panels just to get out of the building, uh, where your 40 kilometer optic might only make it 20. Uh, and you wanna leave some margin in your designs. You've gotta remember that patch cables get moved around, people get up in fiber trays and monkey with things and yank on cables and do bad things. Also, the optic transmitters cool with age. So when you plug in a, a transmitter for the first time, it might be transmitting at plus three dB. Five years later, it might be down to minus one dB. Uh, that just happens over time. And so you've, you've gotta make sure that you've got the, the budget for that. That's why you see a lot of, of the optics you buy brand new. Um, or transmit much higher than spec because they need to stay working over their entire lifetime. Uh, and remember, whenever there's a fiber cut, they send someone out and they add a new splice, and so you're gonna see splice loss and stuff. But this is kind of a, a little diagram showing what it looks like as you see the, the different splice points and the fiber loss and then the, the splice loss, the connector loss and stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's how you, you kind of model your budget. When you're working with amplifiers, um, when you're building more complex uh, WDM system, they come with their own issues, and this is where it starts to get complicated and annoying. So amplifier gain isn't consistent across all wavelengths. It'll, it'll make some wavelengths stronger than others. Uh, and if you've got a, a complex topology, if you've got, you know, let's say you've got 10 different waves all coming together, and five of them come from something that's really close and five of them come from something that's really far, you're gonna start with mismatched power levels. And in order for the amplifiers to work and not cause excessive noise, you need to have the, the signals, you need to have the levels be flat. You can't have one channel that is grossly stronger than all the other channels or it will, will cause noise in the system. So basically what you're doing when you're building a, a complex optical network is you're, you're playing this constant game of flattening so you're, you're variably attenuating the strong signals, flatten it down, amplify it up, flatten it down, amplify it up. So that's why these very complex systems, the ones that are, that are actually building you know, hundreds of nodes or even tens of nodes, where you actually wanna be able to deliver an optical channel from any point to any point, have to have all these complex designs around them. Where if you're just working with a point to point, you might not need two dozen amplifiers uh, that you would need to build these complex topologies. Um, amplifiers also have limits on total system power, uh, both in what they can, can do as an output and what they can take as an input. Uh, so for example, 
you might not think about it, but when, you're, when you actually put 40 channels of a system together, you've created a significant amount of power. You, you might have something that is 10 dB, uh, 10 dBm, a relatively, uh, that's supposed to say minus 10 dBm, a uh, relatively low uh, power level, but you put 40 of those together and all of a sudden you've got a fairly strong signal. You've got a, a 6 dBm signal. Um, if your amplifier's max input power is less than that, that means you need to have weaker signals before you can amplify. So you need to start all the way at minus 22 for each of these channels before you can do the amplification or you're exceeding the, the total system power. Um, and remember, this can also change. This changes dynamically. It changes not only as you plug in new systems, but imagine something as simple as you have a power outage and you lose, lose a pop, and all of a sudden a whole bunch of channels get knocked offline. That's now changed the, the system power. So the more complex systems, uh, they're all talking to each other, and they all know these are the, the signal levels that I need to maintain, and we'll dynamically adjust that over time. Uh, you don't want to do that manually. It'll be a horrific pain. But back in the day, people used to get out there with little tiny screwdrivers and dial little knobs. Um, so like I said, dealing with dispersion. Dispersion used to be a much more serious problem. It's still a serious problem. It's still a, a major impairment and a major limitation. But um, you used to have to deal with dispersion with a, what's called a dispersion compensation unit. It's basically just a big spool of fiber in a box with a slope that goes the opposite direction of the fiber that's used for the transmission. Uh, and it, you, you, at the end of the, the long distance run, you run the fiber through, you probably amplify it, and you run it through the fiber spool that sends it back in the other direction, and it kind of recompresses the, the wavelengths uh, into something that looked more like they were originally when they went in. And you can use circulators to kind of cut down the, the need for fiber in there. But it's, it's literally nothing more than that. On modern systems, uh, we're getting to the point where electronic dispersion compensation is, is doing more and more of this. Uh, so you can now completely compensate for this on the, on the optic or on the, the system itself. Um, the modern long call systems are actually now designed to work with this dispersion. They don't want dispersion compensation units in, uh, and you can go 4,000 kilometers without having to do anything, uh, and that's all accomplished through DSPs. So you've got these advanced digital signal processors that are, that are able to um, figure out what the original signal was intended to be and fix it. Uh, but you're even starting to see EDC into the pluggable optics. So when you start to think about standards like 10G base LRM that could go 300 meters over multimode at 10 gigs, uh, you were able to do that because of the electronic dispersion compensation was integrated into the optic. And the technology keeps getting better and better on this over time too. Um, when you're dealing with regeneration, um, signal regeneration, there's, there's three R's that you have to know about. So the first R is reamplifying. Basically, all you're doing here is you're making the signal brighter. Uh, that's that's going to be an amp. It's a simple analog amp. It doesn't know the free. It doesn't know what's happening inside the signal. It doesn't know if it's a one gig signal or a hundred gig signal. It's just making the light brighter. The second type of uh, of, of regeneration uh, is two R reshaping. Uh, so in this one, you're kind of restoring the original pulse shape uh, to distinguish the ones and zeros. And a full regeneration, the one that, that you're looking for if you want to make sure that it's just like you, you started from scratch, is a 3R. And so you're re-amplifying the signal, you're reshaping the pulses, and you're retiming them. You're making sure that the, di the distance between them is correct. And usually what 3R means is it's a full OEO. Usually 2R means that too, uh, but there might be more chips involved uh, to kind of decode the signal a little bit, uh, recreate it exactly the way it was when it was fresh and send it back out again. And usually when you go through an OEO, that's when it's, uh, when you go from optical to electric to optical again, that's when it's the most expensive because you've got to pay for double the, the transponders. And remember, when you're working with these systems, um, as these impairments add up, as the noise gets worse, as the distortion and dispersion and attenuation and everything happens, the links generally don't outright die. Like, you have to really, really, really break a fiber bad for it to die. What you usually start to see as it, as it gets just a little bit worse and just a little bit worse is the error rate goes up. So where you might have had a, a perfectly acceptable bit error rate of 10 to the minus 15 before, um, now you're, you're getting into... 
0.0001% packet loss. You might not even notice it. You might not notice it at all on an internet network, but it's there. And then as soon as you lose another DB, it starts to go to 1% packet loss. And that you probably do notice, and it starts to get worse. Um, but a lot of times you have to, to monitor for that. You have to monitor your light levels and, and your bit error rates um, to make sure that you're not getting errors that you don't know about in advance so you can fix it. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about coherent optical technologies. This is kind of the, the newest developments that are happening in, in optical. It's been around for a few years, but it's becoming more and more widespread. So what exactly are coherent optics? It's basically a, a group of advancements in optical technology that kind of came together uh, and delivered a significant increase in optical performance compared to where we were at in years past. So the, the general set of technologies that are involved here, you're generally talking about polarization multiplexing. You're talking about more advanced, something more advanced in NR, uh, NRZ uh, for higher order phase modulation techniques. You're talking about using a laser as a local oscillator uh, for the receive side. So you've, you've actually now got two lasers. You've got one on the transmit side and one on the receive side. And you use the one on the receive side to lock into exactly the type of signal that you want to receive. So one of the cool uh, aspects of that is you actually don't need a MUX to, um, to receive a coherent signal. You can send 40 different channels at a coherent receiver and it will lock into exactly the one that it wants and ignore all the rest. And the fourth thing that kind of ties all this together is the DSPs, the, the digital signal processors. And this is kind of the, the magic secret sauce that makes all this possible. It, it takes all these different signals and different paths that have gone out, recombines them, compensates for the impairments, does so at lightning speed, and turns it back into, uh, into something that you can use. Uh, and when you, when you saw these technologies start to roll out, you saw uh, jumps from 1.6 terabit being the best we could do as you know, 160 by 10 gig uh, straight into 9.6 terabit systems. Now we're into 20 plus terabit systems and, and only going up from there. Um, it got you true 100 gig and now even 200 gig optical signals instead of just being limited to 10. Uh, it made these high bandwidth signals be more usable over long distance and it got rid of the, the need to do all this physical dispersion compensation. Um, so talk a little bit more about the, the improved modulation techniques. Like I said, historically, uh, it was IMDD uh, modulation, the very simplistic bright for a one, dim for a zero type stuff. Um, what that, that gets you is one data bit per symbol. Uh, so when you're talking about a 10 gig E technology, you're talking about 10 gigabaud. You're talking about 10 billion times a second this thing is, is flashing and changing. And adding more bandwidth that way, making that, that flash faster and faster only goes so far before you start to hit impairments, and that's what caused this, this 10 gig barrier. Um, and so what we've, what we've started to do is move into different modulation techniques that yield more data bits per symbol. So the, the first one, or the, the kind of the simplest one that people use today is, is QPSK, quadrature phase shift keying. It lets you do two bits per symbol. Uh, and you're starting to see 8 qualm, 16 qualm. You're actually now starting to see on the roadmap 32 and 64 qualm systems um, that are probably within a year, you'll start to see those in, in metro networks for short spans. Um, and it, it lets you encode a lot more data. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Polarization multiplexing uh, is when you combine two different polarizations of light. So remember light is among a whole bunch of things we don't really understand about light. It's a, a wave propagating through space. And in a cylindrical fiber, you can actually do that in two different polarizations. You can do that in the, the vertical and the horizontal. And the two can pass each other and not interfere with each other. So you can double your bandwidth by sending two different polarizations. And the modern DSPs are what make this possible um, because they, they're able to work with both of these, split the signal, send it out on both, and then recombine it and actually get something usable out of it. Um, but that's, that's what's happening when you're, you're looking at these modern, modern systems. Um, so putting all that together, uh, you're able to do right now, you're able to take a, a 25 gigabaud signal, um, do dual polarity on it, and do QPSK on it, and that's how you get to 100 gig. And you're able to do that over thousands of kilometers. And here's a little table showing kind of where we're at right now. And every DSP implementation is different, every vendor is different, all these specifics are different. Uh, some people are better at making the DSPs than others, but uh, in general reach, you're able to do many thousands of kilometers on QPSK. Uh, you're able to do more regional stuff, so like New York, DC, San Jose, LA, that type of stuff. You're able to do uh, 200 gig channels. You're able to get up to 19.2 terabit systems in C-band. 
Uh, and then we're starting to see even newer technology come out where you're gonna be able to do these very short metro hops and do 76.8 terabits on a single fiber. So that'll probably be out in the course of a year. Um, so talk a little bit about the, the tools of the trade when working with fiber. First thing everyone needs is an optical power meter or a light meter, and it displays the brightness of the signal. And it's gonna display it in either dBm or milliwatts. Uh, make really, really careful when you work with these things. Um, they come in two modes. One is a tell me what is actually on the fiber mode, where you take a random fiber, plug it in, and read a strength. And the other is fiber test mode, where it expects that you have a known transmitter on the other side, and it's telling you dB. It's telling you the difference between your known transmitter and what it's got to qualify your fiber versus what's actually on the, the fiber not knowing what the other side is. And if you get the wrong mode, like I said, the difference between dB and dBm will give you very wrong results. Uh, so be careful, make sure that's set right. Ignore every Equinix text who tells you they're getting a plus 70 on your fiber. Probably didn't happen. Um, an OTDR, an optical time domain reflectometer, is a really common tool for testing fiber. And what you're doing here is you're injecting a series of, of light pulses into the fiber and you're analyzing the reflection as it comes back. So you're actually able to characterize the fiber, you're able to see from, from an endpoint what where the splice points are, uh, if there's a break in the fiber, how far out it is. So when there's a, a cut randomly somewhere in the middle of nowhere, they are able to look at an OTDR, see what the distance is, uh, and say, oh, in uh, 37 kilometers out, we know that there's a cut, and we can go send someone to, to look for that cut and fix it. Um, well, it's good for, for testing just to characterize your fiber and know what you're, you're working with. Here's a, an example OTDR output, and you can see the, the splice points and the reflection and, and everywhere there's an event and all the different uh, optical characteristics and loss and things uh, as, it, as it comes through. So now I get to the, the fun section of all the really weird, obscure things people wanna know about fiber. Can I really blind myself by looking into the fiber? Beware of big scary lasers. Do not look into being with remaining eye. The answer to that is, Lasers are grouped into four safety classes. Um, so there was a, an old name and a new name. I'm going with, I think I have both in here actually. But So a class one laser is something that is completely harmless. It is either so low powered that it can't do anything to you, or it's inaccessible. So for example, your DVD player has a laser that is more powerful, and I'm sure people still have those for when they don't have the cloud working. Um, it, it, it's more powerful than what would be class one, but because it's inside a metal shell where you can't possibly access it while the thing is playing, it's, it's classified as class one. Uh, there's a, a subclass of that called a class 1M, and that's harmless as long as you don't look at it in a microscope. Uh, but generally speaking, class one is completely harmless, can do nothing to you no matter what. Class two is only harmful if you intentionally stare at it. So for example, your ordinary laser pointer, probably the one that comes on this thing, uh, maybe not, this one's like green. Um, your ordinary laser pointers, your supermarket scanners, like if you don't want to blind yourself, you should go, hey, that's in my eye, and close your eyes. Uh, if you do want to blind yourself, you could stare right at the supermarket scanner and probably hurt your eyes. Uh, but it's, it's protected by the blink reflex. Class three is something that should not be viewed directly at all. Uh, so there's, there's two subsections to that, and the, in the new system it's called 3R, in the old system it was 3A and 3B, now it's 3R and 3B. Um, the, the lighter class system uh, is, is more of the, the high-powered laser pointers that you see people buy, where's Avi, he's usually running around with one. Um, it's the, the ones that you see people buy on the internet from China that may or may not be legal, uh, because they're, they're supposed to be, you know, once you get above a certain amount of power, you're supposed to have a key and an interlock system and stuff. And they're, they're so dangerous that if you, even if someone was scanning it across the room and it accidentally crossed your eye, before you could blink and know about it, it would cause damage. And class four is the stuff that melts, burns, destroys Alderaan, generally does bad things, cuts steel and things. So when you talk about laser, laser networking lasers going into the eye, uh, networking lasers are basically all in the infrared spectrum. Uh, so infrared, there's, there's two parts to infrared. There's what's called near and far infrared. Near infrared, which is IRA, is the 700 to 1400 nanometer range. And IRB, above 1400, is the, um, the, the far, far infrared, short wave infrared. 
And the interesting thing about the human eye is it's actually not meant to see infrared, so it does a really good job of blocking out the stuff that is much further away from what you're designed to see. So your cornea won't even let a 1550 signal get through it, it blocks it out. It's actually the, the, the stuff that you would think is more medium power that's actually able to get through and do any kind of damage at all. So an IR laser, uh, it's still a class one laser uh, because that, that light can't get the, into the eye. Uh, let's see, I have more slides on that. Yeah. All right, so basically every, every optic that you will ever see plugged into a router of any kind is basically a class one or at worst a class one M laser. Uh, it's completely harmless, there's nothing you can do to it, you can sit there and stare at it. Uh, for the most part, you won't even be able to see it. The only thing that you'll be able to see is 850 nanometer, and that's, you're not actually seeing the main signal itself, you're seeing the sideband, you're seeing the signal not being perfect. Um, everything else is outside your, your visible spectrum, uh, but for the most part, it won't do anything to you at all. The only time there is any danger at all is when you've got optical amplifiers, when you've got systems that are designed to do very long haul systems, or if you've got a, a, a mux. So for example, let's say you take 80 different channels and mux them together onto one piece of fiber. You could take 80 individual things that were all completely harmless, and now that you've amplified the signal 80 times, uh, if you hold that up to your eye, you could do damage. So for the most part, a lot of these, these worries and fears are overrated, and you're not gonna do anything, uh, certainly not looking at a router. And if it is a, a, a real system that matters, there'll be a lot of warning labels on it. Uh, oh, I did have a slide on this. So yeah, if you should be wearing glasses in the color, generally speaking, not, doesn't matter. Even on WDM systems, it disperses so quickly as it goes through air, you really have to like intentionally hold the fiber right to your eye and do something really bad. Um, and like I said, the human eye actually blocks out all the, the long range stuff anyways. And the really, really high power systems all have safety interlock mechanisms. So as soon as they detect, they'll, they'll send a test signal, and as soon as they detect that that's cut, then they'll cut out the, uh, the higher power stuff. So why even try to look into the fiber anyways? Uh, because the human vision can see 800 and, 390 to 750 nanometers. Uh, so technically no telecom signal is, is directly visible. Uh, but if you look, like I said, if you look at an 850, if you look at like a Gigi SX or an SR or something like that, you'll actually see a tiny little bit of red because you're seeing the sidebands. Uh, so one cool trick that you can do is most digital cameras out there can actually see infrared. So you can take your smartphone, and here's an example of a TV remote, and you can see the IR um, on your smartphone. That's starting to get more and more like the modern iPhones. I think they start to put filters on the glass to not allow that to, to happen. It makes the picture quality better, but a lot of systems out there will still see infrared, so you can just hold up a digital camera to it and, and check to see if there's light. Uh, a lot of people ask, can optical transceivers actually be damaged by an overpowered transmitter? And the answer is yes and no. So optics themselves generally all transmit at roughly the same power. So the, the difference between a 10 kilometer optic and an 80 kilometer optic, it's not that one is significantly stronger as a transmitter, it's that the long reach optics have much better receive sensitivities. So where you start to see problems is if you take a, uh, a, a something that is intended for long reach and you blast it with a high signal. So there's a, a couple different threshold points. There's something called saturation point, that's where the, the receiver is just so blinded that it can't do anything with the signal. There's a damage point where actual damage occurs, um, and the actual values all depend on the optic and depend on everything, uh, but generally speaking, only, only your 80 kilometer and above optics are at risk. So here's a little diagram from the world of 10 gig, um, showing that like the, the transmit window and the receive window and you can see in the case of 10 kilometer, uh, everything is, is outside of any type of threshold. Even if you take a 10 kilometer optic and send it down a one inch piece of fiber, uh, nothing bad will happen, it will work, it will work perfectly. The 40 kilometer stuff, uh, if you send it down a one inch piece of fiber and it's designed for 40 kilometers, it'll probably be blind, it won't, it won't actually work, you'll need to attenuate it to, to work, but it won't cause damage but it's the, the really uh, high received sensitivity, the 80 kilometers. Uh, if you, you take an 80 kilometer optic and shove it uh, an inch apart from each other, you'll actually cause damage and burn it out. So another question people ask, do I actually need to be concerned about bend radius or can I just let Equinix text run in and kind of tie knots in my cable or whatever happens? Um, 
Is it a concern? Yes, it is. Um, so it's a, it's a real issue. So remember that the way the fiber works is uh, it, it, a principle called total internal reflection, uh, where the fiber needs to come in, the light needs to come in at a certain angle. So when you bend the fiber outside of its bend radius, it basically causes the light to leak out. So there's actually a couple cool tools people make when you're trying to identify what piece of fiber am I looking at, uh, you're able to make a little clamp meter. You're able to take the fiber, stick a tool on it, and it will bend it just enough to start to let the light leak out the side, and it'll actually measure it through the cladding. Um, but that'll obviously impair your fiber a little bit when you're doing that. Um, like I said, a lot of the fiber that we work with in, in patch cords and data centers is bend insensitive. So what used to be uh, a bend radius of something like this, where you really wanted this nice, gentle sloping curve, you can now kind of wrap it around things and, and not cause problems. So for the most part, you're working with that when you're working with patch cables. Um, a cool trick. People say, can I make two different optical transceivers of different wavelengths talk to each other? And the answer is, between certain types of optics, yes, you can. So almost all optical receivers are wideband. Um, like I said, an, an exception to this is all the coherent stuff where it's actually specifically locking on to a certain signal. But the, the cheap optics that you use in routers for the most part uh, are all, they're gonna see every frequency of light. So they're gonna see everything from 1260 to 1620. Uh, they, they won't see 850, they won't see things that are extremely outside of that reach, but uh, you can take take a 40 kilometer optic and an 80 kilometer optic, a 1310 and a 1550, and they will definitely see each other. And you can actually build a lot of WDM systems are kind of built around this premise. Um, like I said, you can have one wavelength going over A to B and B to A, uh, and you can actually create some systems. Um, do I have an example? Yes, I do. Uh, you can create some, some cool things there. The only gotcha when you do this is power meters will be wrong. So when you use a power meter, you actually have to tell it what frequency of light it's expecting, because it, it's a wideband receiver too, it doesn't know. Uh, so if you tell it, I'm expecting 1310, and then you send a 1550 signal at it, the result that it gives you will be wrong. So you have to be aware of what you're actually reading. So here's a super obscure, super obscure optical networking trick. Um, you can actually take a, a 10 kilometer and a 40 kilometer optic, and you might be able to get 30 kilometers out of it by mismatching the two. The way that this works is the 1550 side has a much lower rate of attenuation. So you're gonna, over the same amount of distance, you're gonna lose almost half the, the attenuation that, that you're gonna lose half the signal that you would have lost had it been a 1310. So that's how the, the 1550 transmit side is able to get its signal further. And on the 1550 side, it's, uh, it's got a much more sensitive receiver. So it's able to hear the 1310 side even though it lost a lot more, more, uh, more, more uh, signal, you're able to hear it better. So you can easily take a, a 10 kilometer, or 40 kilometer optic and pair them together and get 25, 30 kilometers out of it, that, that works. Um, a lot of people ask, do I really need to clean the fiber to have it work right? Yes. Um, so here's a, a diagram showing kind of the difference between a clean connector and a dirty connector and, and the significant impairments that you start to see. If you've got any amount of dust, dirt, grime, filth, spit, whatever on the end of a, of a fiber, it won't mate cleanly. It'll work, it'll still pass a signal, but you'll start to see all of this loss, you'll start to see all these issues. Uh, and you should really take the time if you're gonna, you're gonna plug in fibers and expect them to work well and right, especially your, your WDM stuff, your common stuff, take the time to clean those things, clean the tips, clean the connectors, you can get little tool kits that make it as easy as ch -ch -ch, click in there and it cleans it, uh, and it will make life a lot better. In places that don't do this, you'll tend to have reliability problems. So a couple little bits of miscellaneous fiber information before I completely bore everyone to death. A lot of people say, how fast does fiber travel in fiber since it's not empty? Um, so an SMF28 core has a refractive index of 1.468. That means the speed of light in fiber is around 200,000 kilometers per second instead of 300,000 kilometers per second that it would be through a vacuum. So more or less, you can say that's two-thirds the speed of light. Uh, and you can do the math on that and see that for every 100 kilometers 
of, uh, of, of round trip times, so that's what you would see in a ping or trace route, the latency is gonna go up by one millisecond. And that's entirely caused by the, the propagation of, of light through fiber and the speed of light. So if you ever see why am I getting a much higher value than that, I'm, I'm only going 50 kilometers, I'm adding much more latency to that. Remember, fiber is almost never in a straight line unless you're a high-speed trading network who designed it that way. It's usually laid in rings, it's, uh, it's laid where the population goes, uh, it, it can take significant detours, uh, people have dispersion compensation, it goes through buildings, it goes through patch cables, it goes through OEOs, that, all that stuff starts to add up and, and cause some of the latency too, but from a pure light perspective, every 100 kilometers that you go, or every 62.5 miles that you go, you should expect to see one millisecond of latency RTT. And I think that's it. Questions? Anybody? Wow, I really did put everyone to sleep. <laughs> uh, which is faster, copper or fiber? Uh, I think, isn't copper technically faster from a latency perspective? Yeah. Yeah, one, well, one, Awesome. We had some latency issues there <laughs> with the copper. Um, so, uh, Matt Peterson from SF Mix, can you talk briefly about UPC versus APC? Because some people get burned by that. Okay. Um, so, one thing I didn't talk about was different fiber connector types. I should probably add that. Um, there's there's a couple different. Um, you know, as we've seen the evolution of fiber types from, from things like used to be FC up to SC, ST, SC, LC, uh, now we're getting into MTP connectors, things like that. Um, there's different ways, there's different, different fiber itself and different ways to polish those ends. So the, the most common stuff that you'll see out there uh, is called UPC, ultra polished, and it's just a, a straight, flat, well polished end. Um, I think those are all blue tipped. So if you ever see fiber and it has blue tip, that's a, a UPC. Uh, if you ever see fiber that has a green tip, that's APC, it's angled. So the, the end of the fiber is cleaved with a certain angle. And the reason that you do that is it, it helps with reflections. Uh, so where you'll tend to see that these days is some very exotic long haul system, uh, something that goes through a whole bunch of panels. Um, you're actually starting to see that some now in, uh, in um, the four by 10 breakout, so the, the 40 gig standards, um, when, you, when you've got a 40 gig optic and you wanna turn that into four by 10, uh, the, the connector itself, the MTP connector that breaks that out into four different lanes is, is APC. And you can tell the difference between the, the green, the green uh, little plastic end and the, the blue end. Don't plug the wrong type into the wrong type or it won't work and it won't work very badly. Anybody else? I guess that's it. All right, big thank you to Richard for a very awesome presentation on fiber. I think we all enjoyed that one.